in the autumn of 2017. You know, life was good. I was presenting the Premier League of Sky, so I'd got kind of to the top. We had an eight-year-old boy called Ethan. We married 12 and a bit years. And then really out of nowhere, Gemma starts to feel quite ill. All of a sudden, headaches that wouldn't go, bruises that were not going, immense fatigue. And we went from, on a Monday night, her being diagnosed with a blood cancer of some sort. And for a couple of days, things were looking okay and the treatment was going well and then everything just cartwheeled out of control on the Friday. She falls unconscious and by 8.30 that Friday morning, I'm being told by a consultant, she's not gonna see out the day. And the very foundations on which your life feels like it's been built are trembling, like, like there's a massive life earthquake going on. And by quarter to six on that Friday in November 2017, at the age of 40, with an eight-year-old son and a husband, she's gone. And the first thing that I did when I came out of the hospital that night was I just sank to my knees and shouted at God, why? Why, why, why? Why have you left my boy without a mum? I don't get it. I don't get you, God. And anger was the theme of those first few weeks in terms of my relationship with God. Because I pray for the most faith I've ever prayed on that Friday, in that November of 2017, that God would intervene. That the bleeding in her head that had led to this catastrophic chain of events on that day would stop, but it didn't. I remember the day of her funeral and I remember the, the hearse coming down through the December darkness and seeing the lights of the hearse at the gates and I just, I just collapsed onto the gravel in, in agony and I just shouted out no and it kind of reverberated across the crematorium and the cemetery and uh, a mate of mine called Carl, who's just an amazing Christian guy, and my friends kind of hauled me back up again, the gravel falling off my suit. And he prayed this prayer and I still can hear his gruff voice now. And he just said, God, I pray right now in this moment that your peace would descend on this place and on this man and on this family, amen. And into this cold chapel we went, which was everything I imagined it to be, just grim, lacking any kind of hope. And yet for the first time that day, this remarkable peace descended. For the first time since everything had happened in those first three weeks, I was able to smile at the memories I had of being alongside Gemma, of all those moments we had together as a family and as a couple, and felt at peace with where we were now. And that's not saying that everything that followed after that was easy, because it really wasn't. But for the briefest of moments, this remarkable peace descended to such an extent that later that evening, a friend of mine who doesn't really have a faith, she said to me, I've never felt a sense of peace like I felt in that place, and yet that place was horrible. And that's what that peace is that passes all understanding. It's God's peace coming into places where you objectively look at it and think there should be no sense of peace here. This is horrible. Your first wife has died at half time in life. Your son now doesn't have a mother. We are full of grief, we are full of pain, we are hurting and yet we feel at peace. It's God's peace breaking to places of chaos. That's why it surpasses all understanding, because when you look at it from a human point of view, it makes no sense. One Saturday morning, it was the Saturday after the funeral. I think that's when the true gravity of what's happened hits you. And I remember that Saturday morning, just waking up really early. I was as low as I'd been. And I just remember walking out the house and I put my dressing gown on and a pair of Wellington boots. And I just sat on this tree right by the River Thames that runs down the end of our garden where we lived in Reading at the time. And it was just a gloomy morning and the fog kind of matched my mood. I felt like I was in this, this just fog of grief and pain and I leant against this tree and it was only a brief moment, but this moment came where the darkness just felt so inescapable, so oppressive that I thought I can't do it. I, I cannot do this. I'm not cut out for this grief, I'm not cut out for rebuilding life. I'm not cut out for being strong enough to navigate my eight year old boy through the next few years. And I wanted to roll in to the Thames. I kind of just wanted to let go of life for a moment. And thankfully two things happened. The, the, the first thing that happened is straight away the image of Ethan was so strong in my mind that I thought I can't, I can't, he's just lost his mum. But the most powerful thing that happened is that as I sat there, I kind of looked to my left and I just had this really strong sense that there was someone sat there. And I could see the image of this man who was just looking at me. 
and he was saying nothing. And I could just see, I could see him weeping. And I could just see him weeping. And then he was gone. And to this day, I believe, and it just felt so powerful at the time that that was Jesus sat alongside me. And in the same way in the Bible, it tells him weeping tears at Lazarus' tomb. It felt like Jesus right in that moment was there saying, I understand, I've been there. I know what this feels like. I am gonna walk with you through this. And I just remember this surge of kind of strength running throughout me and I thought, I've got to get up. I'm gonna walk back to the house and I'm not giving up. Didn't make everything better all of a sudden. Life didn't suddenly become easy. But in that moment, I understood in a fresh way, in a new way, in a really, really powerful way that when you hit those darkest moments in life, when you hit something massively challenging where it feels like God has left the room, God has gone quiet, God has kind of just left you behind, he hasn't, he hasn't. I believe for quite a long time after Gemma died that life was never gonna be good again. I know it can't be the same again, it's impossible. We are all made in God's image and we are all totally and utterly unique. So we are all, whether we like it or not, accept it or not, irreplaceable. So I knew life couldn't be the same again, but I'd, I'd led myself to a place where I didn't believe it could be good again. I felt my job in life now was to be the best dad I possibly could be for Ethan, to get him through to leaving school, to maybe going to university, and then my work was done. I just thought it was going to be a second-rate life from there on in. I had no more expectation than that. I remember just a really significant moment in the May of 2018, which was Gemma's birthday weekend. And I had this moment on that May evening, I could feel the warmth of the sunshine on my back, and this phrase is going around my head, plan B, second rate, second best. And then I thought about God. And I thought, is the God that I follow the God of second bests or the God of second chances? I know he's the God of second chances, but with God, it's not about second bests. He wants the very, very best for us. And at that moment, I just had this kind of light bulb moment. I thought, my life isn't now about it all being second rate. I believe that God somehow, through everything that's happened, can restore me and can bring about a new life that will be different. But why can't it be as good? God is the God of new creations. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. So now I appreciate life in a very different way to the way I did before. And to see how God has brought love into my life again with Doreen has been the biggest surprise, but just an amazing blessing. I just never thought someone would want to love someone like me. Way too much baggage. The suitcase in terms of my life is way too big. Leave it alone. And yet he has bought restoration in terms of love. And now to have a daughter, Talitha, who came through a really difficult premature period and just see God at work in that situation, how he cared for her. He cared for Doreen, he cared for us as a family and brought us through. You know, God is the God of second chances. God is the God who rebuilds lives, who brings restoration out of wreckage. And that's, that's been a story of my life over the last five years. That's what God does in people's lives. Not just people who've gone through loss, but people who've gone through life-changing events, people who've gone through spectacular failure, loss of identity, loss of relationships, whatever it might be. They look back and see how God has restored them. When I get questions, as I still do, how on earth do I find my way through this? People who've lost loved ones, husbands, wives, children, parents. That's always the thing they want to know is how do I find hope again? How do I get through this? I've got this amazing picture of home. I can't remember who painted it, but it's this image of Jesus reaching down into this puddle, this water, and just clasping, grabbing this hand. And that's what hope was like in this period, like that anchor that Hebrews talks about is that no matter how big the wave that hit you, no matter how hard the wind was that was blowing, no matter how dark the sky was kind of above you, you were always anchored, you were always held by him. I was always, always held. My impression of God was that, that he'd gone, that he'd left the building in that 2017, that kind of the first few months were on my own. My understanding now is that he never left my side for one moment.